Good Sunday morning to everyone. This is the Meek Street Church of Christ, and we're here today studying God's Word today. And I hope you'll take your Bible and follow along with the lesson of the hour today. We're going to talk about a very big subject, but it's also a subject that is often misunderstood because of a lot of the false teaching that's out there today about uh, how that there's only faith required and you really don't have to obey God in everything. We're going to look at the subject of obedience today in a, actually a two-part lesson, as you see from the chart, that this is Learning Obedience, Part 1, as we'll look at God's Word this particular Sunday morning, as we've come together to feast upon the very Word of God itself. And our lesson text is taken from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, where the Bible says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. This is talking about Jesus, the very Son of God, who came and left all the beauty of heaven to come and die on the Roman cross so that you and I can have salvation. And so he's talking about the fact that Jesus learned obedience and how the Hebrew writer is stating to us this was something that's really unusual to the life of Christ while he was in heaven as he did not come to die on the cross every day. This was something that was a unique experience. In this way, the greatest act of Christ's obedience was to suffer and die on the cross. And he experienced that fully. And so you and I can be so thankful for all that Jesus did in doing what he's... But we can learn a lot of things from Jesus. You know, experience this idea of obedience and experiencing obedience is something we all have to learn. Even from our childhood, we learn, even at a young age, what it's like to obey our parents, and then we obey law enforcement, and in other ways. We obey a lot of things in life. We're never in the sense of, of making up the rules of self, unless we're a king in that regard. But we understand even God is our king. Jesus is our king that we listen to in a spiritual way. He is the king of kings and lords of lords. So we look at him in that way. But I want to look at obedience, and we're going to look at all scriptures today. I make no apology for that because the Bible is exhaustive. That's why actually we're using two lessons to talk about this. And we'll talk a lot in the first lesson from the scriptures, and primarily the Old Testament, because as we understand, obedience starts when we listen to God. And that's really the idea, because even the Latin word to obey means to give ear to or to listen and it's also talking about the idea of listening to the intent of carefully doing what someone is saying to you to do. And so being it starts when we listen to God. And that's the primary point of all of that is that in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 27, Moses wrote a long time ago, Go near and hear all that the Lord our God says. Then speak to us all that the Lord our God speaks to you, and we will hear it and do it. That's what they wanted Moses to be, the one who would go up and receive the law and would give them what God said. Because remember back at the time in Exodus where they were there up in the mountain, they sent Moses up, and so he went. And the Bible tells us that he delayed, and then he brought down the Ten Commandments as the people of God were to come and be directed by that. We know they were already breaking the Ten Commandments, the, at least the one to not make the, any golden images or graven images. And so God wants us to hear and to listen, though. That's the point. So we want to know all what God says in listening to his words that he gives to us. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 18 and, and 19, the Bible speaks here when Moses predicted about the Messiah, Jesus, would come. And the Bible says, I will raise up a prophet from among their own their, their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak them uh, to all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to the words which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. This is the one they would come to listen to, the great spokesperson, the one, the prophet that God would raise up just like Moses. And it was Jesus. Moses was speaking by inspiration about the time when Jesus would come and would give all the people the words to listen to and obey. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, as he's wrapping up or he's talking about the things at the end of the second giving of the second re 
uh, stating of the laws in Deuteronomy chapter 31, we begin by talking about some of the things Moses would say as they would gather together. You know, one of the things we do, we come together as the people of God, even today, we come together to listen to the words of God, just like they did back in the Old Testament days. They would gather together just in these occasions to listen. And we understand we don't have our ears open to what God has to say. In verse 11, the Bible says, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place which he will choose, you shall read this law in front of all Israel in their hearing. And so they were to listen to the law of God being read to them in their hearing. Verse 12 says, Assemble the people, the men and the women and the children, and the alien who is in your town, that they may hear and learn and, and fear the Lord. Uh, God, as long as you live, uh, fear the Lord your God, and be careful to observe all the words of this law. Their children who have not known will hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live on the land which you're about to cross the Jordan to possess. And so even their children, you know, back in that first picture, a little child in the Bible there, and he's got his hand, he's looking at scripture, maybe even for the first time. You know, we teach our children to look at the word of God as the book of books. That is the most important book. It's the rule map. It's the road map. It's the love letter, but it's also the instruction guide of living, how to live your life. It's all those things. God wants us to know what we need to do in order to be saved and how to live the life that is acceptable to him. And so that's why he gives us the word, that so we can listen and to do what God says for us. In Matthew chapter 7, as he's concluding the Sermon on the Mount, in verses 24 to 26, he says, Therefore, everyone who hears the words of mine, who's the words from? From Jesus. He says, These words of mine and acts on them. They may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. He's talking about basically how we live our lives. What is the foundation of everything that we're doing? Is it built upon Jesus and his words, or is it built upon the sand that will soon pass away? As we know, Jesus wants us to have a house that stands so we sing that song about the wise and foolish man. We are reminded of the only life that really lasts is one that's built on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to listen to what Jesus has to say if we want our life to endure. And Jesus would say in John chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And that says a lot about who we are as the sheep who are listening to Jesus, like the shepherd who would guide the sheep, take them to where they need to feed, and would even care for them in times when they're sick. And all that happens because we have a Savior. We have a, a, a shepherd who cares about the sheep, but the sheep listen to that shepherd. They hear Jesus' voice, and they, follow, they know him, and, they, and I know them, and they follow me. It's basically what the Scripture is telling us. We have to follow Jesus. And the way we do that, by listening to what he says. Even when Jesus was before Pilate, Pilate asked what truth is. And every, he says, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. John 18, verse 37. That tells us if we want to be of the truth, we have to listen to Jesus' voice. Not just an audible voice, but it's the voice from the word of God. The four gospels that tells us about the life of Jesus we read those passages of Scripture in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're listening to the voice of Jesus, and really the voice of, of Jesus and Paul as he's writing the words of Jesus and, and also other writers of the New Testament, Peter and other apostles, James, the brother of Jesus. They all tell us really what Jesus has to say to us by the inspiration of the gospel. But I also want to suggest that some things about this idea of obedience and listening to Jesus and obeying him, I want to suggest that not listening to God is disobedience. At least it leads to that. As we don't want to listen 
There's times we close our ears and our minds and our hearts to God. That is disobedience. And then we can never obey God until we are fully listening to what he has to say to us. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 13 to 15, the Bible tells us there about the time when people of God were taught in parables. And this is right before the parable of the sower. Actually, he gave the parable of the sower. And in between that, he talks about why he gives the parables and, and such. He says, therefore, I speak to them in parables because while seeing, they do not see. While hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart... Of the hearts of this people have has become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. And otherwise, they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. And Jesus is telling that you're not willing to listen. Those who would listen to parables and dismiss what Jesus had to say, they would be so close-minded as those Jews, those leaders of the Jews who did not want to listen to what Jesus had to say. They were not going to obey what Jesus said in any regard. In Acts chapter 7, verses 57, verse 57 tells us, here when Stephen is before the council, we're going to come back to Stephen in just a few moments, but I chose this particular verse out of what was done there because Stephen had his last discourse. He preached to them. You might say the history of the Jews and how that God's people were blessed when they followed in the path of God. But then when they came to Jesus, that's when everything turned around because he said some things about what they did not want to hear. The Bible says because they did not want to listen to what Stephen had to say, they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with, with one impulse. And the Bible tells us they rushed and they stoned him because they were not willing to listen to what he had to say. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, again, the Bible tells us about this idea of being dull of hearing. And that's a sad condition. Here he's talking about God's people, the, the New Testament age, the Christians that the Hebrew writer is talking to. He says, concerning him, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God and have come to need milk and not solid food. Here he's saying, I have a lot more to say, but you're not able to hear it because of your dullness of hearing. That says a lot about the condition of their ears. You know, at this point, it may not be sin per se, like it was with the Jews there, but they were on the road to apostasy in a lot of ways because that dullness of hearing, unless it's corrected, can lead to disobedience in the lives of those who were not listening to what God says. But obedience demands, though, submission to God. That's one of the great things about the idea of coming to God is submitting to him, saying, well, not my will, but your will be done. That's the attitude we have to have, just as Christ submitted to the Father. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, again, the Bible tells us how Jesus came to uh, him I came to the cross and all that because God said, you need to be the savior of the world, and Christ went. In verse 5 of Philippians chapter 2, it says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he but entered himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And I want to say, if death comes to us, the Bible tells us there were some who gave their lives. They did not keep their lives precious. They died for the Lord Jesus Christ. As the Bible says, they were martyrs, just like Stephen and others who gave the all because they were following the example of Jesus. And then we submit that. Jesus was, was obedient even to the point of death. That's really going back to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 again. But in John chapter 12, notice how he lived his life as well. Here he talks about who, what he's saying and where he gets his words from, basically. 
He says, for I have not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. And that says a lot about how Jesus, in submission, under authority of the very Father, he would be given the words do what the Father, and it'd be in agreement with what Jesus and the Father were all one about, the idea of listening to what God had to say and saying those words. That's what he would speak, as the Bible tells us. In Luke chapter 22, verse 42, as I mentioned, the idea when Jesus would go to the cross, he would say, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And so that's exactly what Jesus did in submitting to the Father. We have to defer, don't we? We have to give in and say, well, my will is not more important than God's will. And whenever there's time that we, when those two, there's a conflict of interest, there needs to always be God's will that always wins out in the life of, of a Christian. That's what obedience demands is submitting to the very will of God so that we can be saved. And we submit to Christ today. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, the Bible says a lot about this idea of submission and, and, and what really the Great Commission is talking about there. In Matthew 28, verse 18, the Bible says, Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That says a lot about who we're under today. We're under the authority of Christ. And that we're to go out and tell others, teach them about what Christ says. Notice that last part says, teach and observe all that I command you. And then we understand what that means that we're under authority, we're in the submission to what the word of God from Jesus Christ is all about. That's the most important thing is what, what does Jesus say? What does he say to our lives? And how can we live according to his will? In Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 to 19, the Bible says, For by him, talking about Christ, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and, by, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and is the beginning, the firstborn for the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. So again, that's what I was saying. Right along with everything I said, now I can't say any better than that, what Jesus is, He's our top priority. And we submit to him in humble obedience to him. That's exactly what God's want, God wants. As, it's the only way we really can. You know, we can stubbornly try to do our own will, but we'll be lost in that process. Did you know that not submitting to God is disobedience? And that's really, we know that very well, don't we? Because when I am angry because somebody says, well, you need to obey Christ and do what the Bible says. And we get angry and we get upset because there's something we'd rather do ourselves. And again, going back to that conflict of interest, you know, sometimes people simply are not willing to give in to the will of Christ like they should and, and to do what God wants us to do. In Jeremiah, a long time ago, Jeremiah chapter 7, his own people would say some things about that. Kind of reminds me of Matthew 7, but it's in Jeremiah 17, verses 21 to 23. The Bible says, Thus says the Lord, take heed for yourselves, and do not carry any load on the Sabbath day, or bring anything through in through the gates of Jerusalem. You shall not bring a load out of your houses on the Sabbath day, or do any work. But keep the Sabbath day holy as I commanded your forefathers. Yet they did not listen nor incline their ears. That's the sad part about this. Kind of reminds you of Jeremiah chapter 6 as well. We'll talk about that in another lesson. But here it's talking about they did not listen to what God had to say. And they or inclined their ears, but stiffened their necks in order not to listen or take correction. That's really the saddest part about that is the fact that they, they simply were not going to listen. They were stiff-necked. In other words, they weren't going to bend and yield 
kind of like the donkey. As we understand there's animals that sometimes are stubborn, mules and such. They are, are going to stiffen their neck and not going to move. And if they don't want to move, they're not going to move. And that's the way sometimes people can be, even in the church today, even in our times, there are people who are still are stiff-necked, who will not do yield, who will not do what God says in any regard on certain matters because they are stubborn and they don't want to do what God says. Just like the Jews in Acts chapter 7, going back to Stephen again. In verse, verse 51, the Bible says, You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. He's mentioned the fact that they, were, they had a heart problem. They had an ear problem. They weren't going to listen. They weren't going to do what God had to say. And so they resisted the Holy Spirit, and they also stoned Stephen because he gave them the good words of God. In Psalm chapter 78, verse 8, again, the people of God are mentioned. It says, and, and not be like their fathers. Here's the psalmist says, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. It all goes back to our heart, doesn't it? Whether you yield from the heart to God and whether you want to go your own way or, or do something, if we sometimes want to neglect some commands or ignore some of the commands of God, we can be very stubborn in that, but we're stubborn in obedience, nevertheless, when we do that. So we need, need not to do that, because God will only save us when we are completely devoted to Him and submit to Him in obedience to the commands of God. And obedience is our third and final point. I want to say that obedience requires action on our part. As we think about what it means to do what God says to do. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 31 to 33. Deuteronomy chapter 5. I want to mention some things about this, these words that I have here on the chart. As I put all these up there. I want you to look actually through the whole Book of Deuteronomy, I want to challenge you. Actually, this is one of the, maybe the time of assignments so sometimes. I want to challenge some of our listeners to, as your assignment, go through the book of Deuteronomy itself, just the book of Deuteronomy, and find how many times each of the words that I have listed are on, actually are used by Moses to describe what they're to do. The word keep and observe and perform and do. And which one is used the most? Now I'll have to go ahead and tell you that one. That last one, the word do, is used far greater than all the others. But we think about what that means. These words are verbs, and they require action. As, as really what verbs are, they are action verbs. We're to keep and observe and perform, just like what Deuteronomy 5, 31 begins by saying, but as for you, stand here by me that I may speak to you all the commands and the statutes and the judgments which ye shall teach them that they may observe them in the land which I give them to possess. So you shall observe to do just as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right or to the left. You shall walk in the way which the Lord your God has commanded you that you may live and it may be well with you that you may prolong your days in the land which you possess. And here Moses is telling them, you've got to keep. You've got to observe God's ways. You've got to perform the very will of God as he gives to you in the Old Testament way of service. That's what they did back then. And they were to do those things. They weren't supposed to just hear and not do those things. But they were to listen and to do and keep and serve and do all the things God had for them. In Psalm chapter 143, verse 10, here the psalmist says, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. As God's word leads us in that way of level ground, God's good spirit is one that, by the word of God, if we will listen and do those things, God is truly leading us. But if what if we're not going to listen to what God is saying? You know, the idea of not doing God's will, again, is disobedience. Because if, if we hear only, we're not doing, we can deceive ourselves. There are several passages that 
actually speak to that issue. Matthew chapter 7, verse, 4, verse 21, the Bible says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. And so we have to do what God says. Don't call him Lord unless he truly is your Lord, unless he is the, your master who you are serving and doing his will because that's what we, that's where the job of the servant was to do the master's bidding that, that he gives to the people that are his servants. And James chapter 1, 22 to 25, the Bible tells us there, go to our scriptures and look as the book of James will tell us not to be deceived. In verse 22, the Bible says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Now, James is actually warning us uh, of a self-deception a time to thinking that we come and we only listen to what God says and we may even agree to it. What if we never do what God said? We're only deceiving ourselves. We're in self-deception thinking, well, everything's all right. I'm listening to God, but I haven't done what he says to do. And verse 23 says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks his natural face in the mirror for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So in other words, God wants us to not only to hear, but also to do. And so that's the only way we're blessed is if we do that. God's blessing is on us if we keep his words. Like James chapter 4, verse 17 also tells us that every, the one who neglects to do the very will of God or actually knows what to do that's good and neglects it. James 4, 17 says, Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. That's one of the ways we say that sin is done is by neglect. And we can neglect the very will of God by simply hearing it and say, well, I know I need to do that, but maybe someday we put it off, procrastinate, or say, you know, I'll do that. You have good intentions. But yet if we do not do what God says, we're still lost. In John chapter 8, verse 29, notice what Jesus says. As he is our example in doing the will of God and in learning obedience, he says, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And if we want to be Christ-like, it's not Christ-like to simply hear and not do. That's simply disobedience. We're not being Christ-like at all because Jesus said, I always do the things that are pleasing him. Do we, can we really say that? Unless we are able to say that, we're not the Christ-like individual that we need to be as far as service to God is concerned. And our relationship, this is actually the last point of this last point, is our relationship is sustained by obedience. And that means that we need to be having obedience in order to have that relationship with God that we need to have. In John chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, he begins the idea of the, the vine and the branches and all that. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so it may bear more fruit. What's this idea of taking away a branch? It means it's cut off. It's cast in the fire. Actually, what John 15 says, he takes away and, and he cast it into the fire. And But the ones who do bear fruit, what is this idea of fruit? It means the evidence of works, means of action that we do. In other words, it's something we do. It's the idea of serving God today, isn't it? We bear more fruit. We, we bear fruit and he prunes us. We can bear more fruit. And he goes on to say about this, how we know this is talking about actions. Because what verses 9 and 10 is talking about, it's doing the will of God here. It says, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. That's a powerful statement because people today who put down commandments and ordinances of God. So, oh, there's nothing to keep today. That commandments, that was the Old Testament way of things. Well, they really don't understand what they're talking about because Jesus still has commandments. 
Remember John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so Jesus has something for us to do today in the New Testament age. And we're to follow him. And nearly this puts the nail in the coffin, as I often will say. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, I was listening to a man one time who was a nominational preacher. And he was saying, well, he was actually one of these all grace and no law people. He said, I can't really explain what 1 John 2, 3, and 4 is talking. You know why he couldn't, he couldn't do that? Because he didn't know. It. It, did not, it did not add up with his theology. It was actually something that was beyond him. Think that there's commands that we are to keep today. But that's what John's saying in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. This is the last verses of the lesson. It says, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments uh, is a liar and the truth is not in him. And so we understand what that means. That if I say I know Christ and know God, and yet I'm not walking in the commandments, I'm not doing what God says, I'm not obedient, in other words, I can't say I, I know him and, and it really be true because I already become a liar if I say that and I'm not doing what God says. So how we have that relationship, how is it sustained? It's by walking God's way. It's walking in his commands. And like I said before, we're not perfect, but we still have to do what God says. We still have to try and strive for perfection. And we fall short, we rely upon the grace of God, the mercy and the sacrifice of Jesus, that blood that cleanses us from our sins. And that's what our relations was built upon today. As we know that God wants us to have a relationship with him, and how do we do that? It's through the word of God. It's by our connection to Jesus as we come to him, our savior, by his will and his, his way of, of service to him. I want to thank you very much for your kind attention lesson today. I understand that also this relationship, it begins when you are converted to Christ. Now, what are we converted to? We're not converted to a church or converted to a way of life, but simply converted to Jesus. I want to tell you that, that when we come to Jesus, everything changes. We walk by his ways. We are converted to Christ when we walk in his ways. We must walk in his ways if we want to have that relationship. Everything changes when you give your life and service to Jesus. And we do that by faith. The Bible says without faith is impossible to please him. We must confess Jesus Christ with the Son of God after we repent of our sins because repentance is a command of God that we must serve him and, and turn away from sin. Confess Christ be the Son of God, Romans 10, verse 10, and be immersed in water, be baptized for the remission of sins. When we come to Christ, that is how we're part of that connection. We are, in a sense, the branches that are connected to the divine Jesus. Again, like I said, I want to explain, we're not converted, in a sense, to the church that gives salvation but we're converted to the Christ that gives us salvation. And then the Lord adds us to his church upon our obedience to the gospel. That's what it means to obey. We'll talk more about that in the next lesson, about obedience and how that all takes place as we understand God wants us to know and to do his way in his service. Thank you very much for your kind attention lesson of the hour today. We will now conclude our Bible study.